Welcome back to On the Trail to Skull Hill. As we celebrate this season of Lent, a bittersweet season, a season commemorating Christ's cross that we prepare ourselves for Easter, for Resurrection Sunday, from Ash Wednesday. 40 days, often accompanied with fasting, often accompanied with liturgy. Today we look at the one of the richest symbols of Christ's sacrifice, one that often churches participate in quite frequently. We call it communion. It's also called the Eucharist. Essentially, it's a cup and a loaf. You can read about this scene in any of the gospel accounts, and there's also some appearances in the writings of Paul. And it's this scene where Jesus is sitting in an upper room surrounded by his disciples and they're celebrating a holiday so the cup and the loaf they have this context uh, that jesus is fulfilling that he's proclaiming that he's participating in that he's shedding further light on but the context is passover this is already part of a celebration that was part of israel's history part of its tradition and part of its way of worshiping God and celebration of what he had done in the past, even as Jesus points toward fulfilling it in the near future at the time he was offering the cup and the loaf to his disciples. So what I wanna do is take a little dive into the imagery associated with the cup and the loaf of communion of the Eucharist that Jesus is alluding to in order for it to shed further light on Christ, the cross of Christ, and his sacrifice for us. It all stems back to Egypt and the event we call the Passover. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, there's this feast where the Israelites on the eve of their deliverance were to tuck their robes into their belt and they were to eat standing and they were to prepare a lamb that would be offered as a sacrifice of atonement and they were to cover the door post of their dwelling place and the final plague that God sends on Egypt the, the the taking of the firstborn would pass over because they would be covered in the blood of this perfect spotless lamb and it's this rich symbol that is a little hard for us because we don't you know, use blood in sacrifices uh, in, in Christianity. Uh, we believe it was fulfilled in Jesus, and that's ultimately what this is pointing to. But just think about this, that the, the feast that Jesus is fulfilling had its origins in the blood of a perfect lamb covering over and protecting people who were on the eve of their deliverance. God's judgment would be poured out upon the firstborn and they would be covered by the blood of a perfect lamb. And they were to eat bread that was a quick bread. It was made in haste. It was a unleavened bread. And that's the kind of loaf that would have appeared at the table in the upper room that Jesus would have shared with his disciples. Another thing you'll find in Jesus' Passover meal with his disciples is the allusion to another part of the book of Exodus, Exodus 24, where the whole group of Israelites who had been freed, rescued by God from this slavery were committing to God. In Exodus 19, God essentially proposes to Israel if they'll be his people. And in Exodus 24, they confirm the covenant with the blood of a bull. And interestingly enough, they say it's the blood of the covenant, and they sprinkle it on the people. So Jesus is actually kind of using the Exodus imagery. We've talked about this in our series in Mark called Mark and Maps shameless plug for that series. It engages the new Exodus imagery, explores that through the book of Mark, and it's really through all throughout the New Testament, that God is doing something afresh in Jesus. As we journey to the cross, we realize some of the significance of the cross is related to the unfolding of an Exodus narrative, of God delivering us through the sacrifice of Jesus as a substitutionary atonement. We understand Jesus is the sacrifice that the Passover 
pointed to. So this all ties together. If you read Luke chapter 22, you'll find an allusion from Jesus here alluding to these two things. So let me read this in part today. I'm going to be skipping around a little bit just to highlight some of these things. So this is Luke chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. So here we have the context set as we've been exploring. Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. So here's how the Passover unfolds. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's saying that that this Passover not only looks back as a commemorative feast of what God did to the ancient Israelites, he's saying it ultimately points forward as well. And it points to the present. This is my body. Take it and eat. Saying that of the bread. Jesus is saying that his sacrifice that he's about to make is fulfilling the, 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 the holiday itself. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Sounding all those Exodus 24 covenant blood illustrations, he's saying that he is the sacrifice. We're going to explore this further as we try to understand what is happening at the cross. Here in the Gospels is this sense that what happened at the Passover event is being fulfilled in Jesus. And so when we take the cup and the bread, the Eucharist, the communion feast. We remember these things. This is the cup and the bread that points us to Jesus, that his sacrifice is one that brings freedom. So as we approach Lent as a sobering season of sorts, again, a bittersweet way to remember our mortality, to remember the cross, these very vivid and, you know, kind of gruesome events that that the the horror of what Jesus was put through. We also remember that this was the f- event that gives us freedom that God loves us so much that he would put on flesh that he would become man, God the son would become the perfect lamb that would become the sacrifice of 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 blood offered that the wrath of God would be satisfied and our freedom obtained. These are really dense theological concepts. And one of the things that I need to keep in mind, we all need to keep in mind, there's a lot of ink spilled on this topic. One of the books I really highly recommend on this is John Stott's The Cross of Christ. I was assigned this book in a seminary class and thought it was very helpful in understanding what substitutionary atonement is. It's a very large tome. I quoted it at the beginning of On the Trail to Skull Hill, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to to ruminate in some of its thoughts. But what I I do want to suggest here is that there's something remarkably approachable about the idea of substitutionary atonement and the eve of the exodus, this new exodus that's unfolding in Jesus, that it's something that you actually participate in tangibly. That communion is supposed to testify to this mystery that we actually eat this and drink this. It's freedom we can taste. So, so realizing that the wrath of God was in some way poured out on himself gives us a new depth for understanding communion, that Jesus would be both the sacrificial and spotless lamb, that he would be the firstborn upon which the 
the wrath was poured out and God himself stepping in on our behalf in order to make sure that we are freed if we would just take his offer. And so the, the complexity and the, the richness of these symbols are, are so worth exploring. And at the same time, it becomes a central Christian practice Yes, to talk about, to theologize, to, to understand, but also to experience, to literally taste it. And that's the invitation of the Eucharist, of communion. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And so while there's much to be said about the, the idea of Jesus becoming the sacrificial lamb, about Jesus Um, satisfying the wrath of God and this really complex thing that's happening both in the Old Testament Passover and the New Testament communion, that it's a mystery in some regards that needs to be experienced. And so on the trail to Skull Hill this week, what I want to invite you to do is to have your family participate in communion this week and read Luke 22. Read texts related to what happened during Jesus' Last Supper, as they call it. Discuss together what it means to consume Christ. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood poured out for, for you. And approach God in this awareness. And some things to think about, to discuss, to journal. How does it deepen communion to think of Passover? and covenant. Discuss or journal your awareness of God as rescuer. How does the Eucharist point you to the cross of Christ? The host became the feast on the eve of our salvation, of our redemptive narrative, of our rescue. But the mysteries of Jesus as our sacrificial lamb, as the blood of the covenant, wash over you as you participate in communion and may these mysteries stir us towards a deeper love and appreciation for what happened on the cross of christ godspeed